Now it's my honor to introduce our guest tonight, the CEO of Vidal Sellers. Vidal Sellers pursues sustainability in, in all farming, winemaking, and business practices. He is one of the youngest win winery CEOs in the world and has led Vidal through brand, facility, and personnel transformations. An active scholar, in addition to running a winery, Trent's writings have been published by Oxford University Press and by the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. He earned degrees in agriculture from Iowa State University, Edinburgh University, and Cornell University, where he is now a PhD candidate in viticulture. Please join me in welcoming Trent Pressler. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I should start off by saying if you were, I see a lot of old friends in the audience. If you were hoping that this was actually a happy hour with wine tasting, it's not, unfortunately, because this is all I could fit in my suitcase. So uh, if you were just here for the booze, you should probably just leave at this point. Um, it's also nice to see that the crows showed up for my lecture. <laughs> it's pretty ominous. It's like some Harry Potter thing going on behind me. Um, I like to walk around a lot and wave my arms a lot, so this is, I might drift away from the mic, but I'll try to speak up. Um, thank you, Pat Miller and the lectures program for inviting me here. Um, it's really exciting, and I was just telling the young man who introduced me, because he's a student member of the lectures committee, uh, that I was actually on the lectures com committee myself as a student uh, 15 years ago now at this point, right? Uh, so time flies and you never know uh, what's going to happen and what will bring you back to the place where you started. So it's really great to be here. And what I'm going to share with you tonight I hope is interesting for most of you uh, since Iowa is such an agriculturally dominated uh, economy and state. Um, I think it will be. My background is in, in farming. I grew up on a cattle ranch in South Dakota before coming to Iowa State in 1995. Um, and I went on to study agricultural economics and horticulture at Cornell University um, and uh, somehow ended up with this wonderful opportunity to manage a vineyard and winery east of New York City, uh, which has been a, a fascinating experience. And I'll share a little bit about that experience with you, as well as the history of our wine growing region and some of the things in the, we're doing and the efforts we're making to integrate sustainable farming practices into the fine wine world. So we'll start with a little um, geography lesson. I don't mean to insult anyone, but in case not all of you are totally familiar with Long Island, I know when I grew up in South Dakota, I had no idea where Long Island was, and I thought that the Hamptons was a mountain chain in Massachusetts, so I was completely off base. Um, this is New York. I'm drifting away from the mic, but I'll speak up. So the Finger Lakes region uh, is a very cool climate region. It's compared often to Germany, uh, in the wine growing sense, big steep cliffs and deep lakes and at the base of Cayuga Lake right there, that's where Ithaca, New York is, where Cornell University is. That's a major wine growing region for fine wine grapes. Over here on Lake Erie there are actually 30,000 acres of Concord grapes, so it's where the Welch's Juice Cooperative is based. It's the largest um, center of, of Concord grape production in the U.S., although uh, Washington State is quickly gaining ground. The Hudson River region just north of New York City was actually the first wine region in the U.S. Uh, that's where the French Huguenots first planted grapes over 300 years ago. And so here, of course, we have New York City, Boston would be up here, and Washington down here. And this is Long Island. So Long Island is a, basically a spit of land that goes about 120 miles east of New York City out into the Atlantic. Brooklyn, where I live, is right here next to Manhattan, and then Queens wraps around Brooklyn. This middle part is Nassau County. Nassau County, the, the coast between Nassau County and Connecticut is called the Gold Coast. That's where the Great Gatsby took place. Uh, and then this little strip of land here on the southern, we call it the South Fork of Long Island, that's the Hamptons, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about, where all the rich and famous people live. And then uh, the North Fork of Long Island, which I'll be talking about today, is this spit of land here that's highlighted. And that is the primary agricultural district in all of New York State. So just a few basic facts so that everyone in the room is on the same page and has the same level of understanding of the industry. 
Um, there's about 3,000 acres of grapes on Long Island, which makes it about the same size as the Pomerol district in Bordeaux. Um, all of our grapes are vinifera. Vitus vinifera is the species of grape that's used to produce fine, dry, European-style wines that you might have heard of. So a cultivar of Vitus vinifera, uh, cultivar names you've probably heard of are things like Merlot and Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, the first plantings were in 1973, so it's a relatively young region, um, but gaining uh, a lot of age on the vines, so the wine quality is improving pretty dramatic, dramatically in the last five to ten years. Um, it is the most expensive uh, farming district, we think, in the world. Effectively, we're, we're farming in a suburb of New York City, and what that affects, besides land prices, that also affects uh, labor costs and taxes, so we have to compete uh, on a salary level for labor, uh, for example, I'll, just one example, we had um, a guy who was helping us mow our lawns around the winery, and he was insisting him that we pay him $25 an hour. And I thought that was ridiculous until I learned that Steven Spielberg was paying him 30 So, you know, when you're in that sort of realm and of that part of the world, people expect certain things. So as a result... Our grapes are actually quite expensive. Grapes on the bulk market, there isn't much of a bulk market, but when they are sold, they're usually um, $1,500 to $3,000 a ton. And of course, the, most, the defining characteristic of our region is that it's an ocean-moderated climate. So you might, I think a lot of people think, wow, you grow grapes on Long Island. That's, I would never have imagined that. And it does defy a lot of, a lot of um, I guess, odds, because looking here at this map, um, Long Island is incredibly uh, dense in terms of the human population. So there are about five and a half million people on Long Island. It's bigger than Chicago, um, and, uh, but it's about 120 miles long by anywhere between 10 and 20 miles wide. Um, the first suburbs in the, in, in the United States were on Long Island. In fact, there's a historic town called Levittown, New York, where they built the first, um, the first true suburban track homes where there were miles and miles of homes that all looked the same. They looked like little monopoly houses. And now you can actually go visit Levittown. It's kind of historic and cool, and all those 50s homes are on the historic register. But it was the first place where America's uh, suburban sprawl really began. And then as you go further and further east on Long Island, um, the terrain opens up, and it really becomes sandy, and there are a lot of dunes and short, scrubby vegetation and it's not as densely populated, although the development pressures are quite intense, which I will talk about. So we're surrounded on three sides by water. Uh, the Atlantic Gulf Stream comes up from Florida with very warm water, and it hits the coast of the Hamptons before heading across to the UK. And so that warms all the waters around Long Island to such a degree, in fact, that we have our own microclimate. So anytime you hear about big snowstorms in New York City, typically those snowstorms are not occurring out where we are, um, the water stays warmer in the winter, and it actually stays cooler in the summer. And so as a, as a result of that, it's a perfect place for growing grapes, because grapes um, need to have a delayed bud break, and we have a, a bud break in May. And then a very long extended growing season, sometimes harvest, lasts all the way into November. Um, Suffolk County on Long Island, this is the number one county in New York State for agriculture. The total value, market value of our products is $168 million dollars. Um, and then the economic, but really what's more important is the economic impact because there's so much tourism with five to six million people living on Long Island. There's a lot of tourism. A lot of people come visit the wineries and the farm stands. Um, it's a wonderful day trip to come out from Queens. You can have a pastoral, bucolic country experience and uh, strap your hay bale or your Christmas tree to the roof of your car and go back to Queens. It's a really wonderful day trip. So the total economic impact is actually a billion dollars. Um, and that includes everything from lodging and hotel and uh, restaurants and accommodation. 30, 32,000 acres of farmland. That's all just uh, some statistics for you. This is a picture of the side lawn of our winery. Um, and Long Island, as very few people realize as well, has uh, the oldest farms in America. So there are uh, several farms on Long Island that are actually in their 12th uh, generation of ownership. Uh, the Wickham uh, Fruit Farm, which is a mile away from my winery, was founded in 1640, and they're in the 12th generation of Wickham men running this farm. So it has a very rich tradition in terms of agriculture, and prior to that, uh, the Korchog Indian tribe farmed this land some 10,000 years ago, 
And the town my winery is in is called Kutchog, which means central place in uh, their native language. And actually today it's interesting, uh, meteorologists have shown that Kutchog is the sunniest city in all of New York State. It receives the most amount of hours of sunlight. So I think that the Native Americans actually knew a few things. Um, this water tower, it's a little water tower we found half buried in our vineyard. And uh, we dug it up and restored it and put it on a stand. We believe this is what the original farmers on this homestead used to water their potato crops. Um, this was the David's family potato farm. The house on our, on our vineyard was, was built in the 1700s. And we found um, some warhead, um, Indian arrows and some uh, Revolutionary War musket beads. Um, there's a lot of history on Long Island uh, to be appreciated and to learn about. <coughs> there is a geologist in the, in the audience, in fact, a geologist from upstate New York. So for her, I'm going to play this fun little video about how, how the soils on Long Island came to be. And that'll be the end of the science lesson, and we can start talking more about, about the wine. All right. Oh, wait a second. So the volume's not working in the room. Let me just plug it into a different port and see if that works. We're the port at the base of what's become Long Island Sound. I'm going to start over. The geologic history of Long Island began millions of years ago when an ancient river carved out the basin that would become Long Island Sound. When the glaciers of the last ice age advanced on southern New England, they moved through this basin, carving it out even deeper before coming to a halt. At this point, the glacier's rate of advance was at equilibrium with its rate of melting, and for perhaps a thousand years, the ice remained in this position, constantly discharging meltwater along with millions of tons of rock, sand, and gravel. This sediment built up a ridge called the Moraine, which about 50,000 years ago formed the south shore of Long Island. As the melting increased around 21,000 years ago, the ice margin began to retreat, then paused again, forming a second moraine in line with the North Fork. As the ice retreated further, this second moraine acted as a dam for glacial runoff and the Long Island Sound Basin became a massive glacial lake which persisted for centuries, depositing tons of sediment in its bottom before draining rapidly around 16,000 years ago. The continental ice sheet was now melting rapidly and huge volumes of water were returning to the oceans. As sea level rose, the bed of a recently drained glacial lake became filled with salt water, and Long Island and its surrounding waters as we know it today began to take shape. And this is the Long Island we know today. Okay. Um, oops. Okay, in case anyone was thinking it, I did not get permission from Yo-Yo Ma to use that music. Okay, I know that there's a lecture later tonight about patenting and, and creativity and legal rights, so just don't turn me in. Okay, uh, that's the end of the science lesson, and um, who knew all that about Long Island, right? Brooklyn, Queen, one person did. Two people. Um, but uh, it's, it's a fascinating place, and you know, we take a, a rap in the wine world because we don't have the dramatic scenery of a place like Napa or the, the Andes in Chile. And it's flat. It's flat as a cornflake. And um, we like to show people that actually the soils are quite uh, interesting and diverse and unique and, and perfect for growing grapes. So this is a profile that we built. We have it on display at our winery. Um, it's a soil profile. It's not really to scale. There's a little mini tractor on the top there an homage to Iowa, I guess, although it's not green, sorry. Um, but there's usually only three to six inches of topsoil on Long Island, and then uh, a layer of subsoil anywhere from three to 10 feet, and always um, a little ribbon of clay. So that's clay right there, anywhere between one and three inches of clay. And Merlot happens to really like um, clay. Um, but that clay, the presence of that clay is one of the things that determines how well the soils drain. Um, and then there's just pure sand, 
And in a lot of the beaches on the North Fork, you see this kind of beach stone, which are soft, uh, weathered stones. So even though topographically above the ground it may be flat and un uninteresting, below the ground it's actually quite diverse. <coughs> so this is me with a, I don't know, a 30 or 40 pound striped bass, and you're wondering what in the world does that have to do with anything. But as I mentioned, we're surrounded on three sides by water. And we have a very fragile uh, marine ecosystem uh, around our agricultural region that um, we have to protect. And it's, it's been healthy for thousands of years, and we don't want to be the people responsible um, for its decline. The stripers, the striped bass, migrate uh, through the waters of Long Island Sound and Peconic Bay. There's also a species called the Peconic Bay scallop, which is absolutely delicious, and it was endangered in the 70s and 80s and had a resurgence. Um, and uh, so this leads into the sustainability question. Um, on Long Island, there is obviously huge uh, and tremendous development pressure uh, with all the people living there. Their, uh, the groundwater ecosystem uh, is very fragile, and that's something we really feel we have to protect. And not only that, but we really feel, especially in the society that we live in, that uh, we want to be seen as being responsible and proactive um, guardians of the future of farming on Long Island. So to that end, um, I'm going to skip over a few of these things. Actually, this is just a shot of what a vineyard looks like on Long Island. Um, almost military precision, and I'll get to this later, but we keep the canopies uh, strictly maintained between two to four inch catch wires to allow optimal sunlight and air exposure to the fruit. These are some helicopter shots that I took of our vineyards showing the proximity to the water so you get an idea of the delicacy of this balance here. And this is not populated on this end of Long Island. Um, it's, uh, it's actually still quite pastoral and beautiful. This is our Bedell Cellars property. We have three vineyards for 100 acres total. This is one of the three. Um, and this is our Cory Creek Vineyard property. This is actually on the other side of Long Island, so this is on the Peconic Bay side as opposed to the Long Island Sound. Uh, but you can see the estuary and Cory Creek coming in in my house is, used to be right there in the woods. Um, but it's a beautiful place to live, um, and agriculture and farming is certainly part of the culture, and so are things like fishing and sailing. Um, and it's a really wonderful, beautiful place that we're all interested in protecting. Some of the major red grapes that we grow, Merlot is king on Long Island. Probably about 30% of the acreage there is planted to Merlot. Um, as well, Cabernet Franc, Pinot Noir, and Cabernet Sauvignon are grown on Long Island. And then there's a second tier of red uh, Vitus vinifera grapes grown there, uh, Malbec, Syrah, and Petit Verdot, which are primarily used as blending grapes, although I am here to say that I think Syrah has quite a future on Long Island, even though it's typically known as a hot climate grape um, because its homeland is in the Rhone in France, it actually does quite well for us. So this is um, a Merlot grapevine, uh, typically structured for Long Island, so everyone can see what it looks like and how we practice our horticulture. First of all, you'll notice below there's a cover crop, meaning clovers and fescues and, and grasses growing under the vines which I'll talk about later. Um, one dominant trunk, cane prunes. So every year, um, all the growth is cut off, and one cane is laid back down every spring for the renewal growth. And then typically on Long Island, we thin the clusters to one cluster per shoot. And this is very meticulous and very labor intensive and very expensive to do. But we do it for a couple reasons. One is so that the, the, vine, the grapes ripen more easily. Um, if the vine has fewer clusters to ripen. In theory, they would have more um, photosynthetic capacity to, to channel into those grapes. Just like um, an analogy, if any of you are, are home gardeners and you prune all the buds off of a rose bush, the remaining bud is probably going to end up being a pretty big rose. Um, and then also, we, we have to do all this work because of where we're growing grapes, which is an extremely humid and wet climate. Long Island's one of the wettest places in the world uh, for growing grapes. And that leads to a lot of disease pressure from things like powdery mildew and downy mildew and black rot and phomopsis and all these wonderful things that you may or may not have ever heard of. Um, but they're diseases that afflict grapevines um, specifically. 
And they are, those diseases and their pressure is what makes sustainability on Long Island such an interesting conundrum. This is a Cabernet Sauvignon canopy. Actually, that photo was taken near Thanksgiving in November of 2007. It was such a hot year um, in 2007, and such a great ro growing season, um, that the canopy was healthy and functioning all the way through to Thanksgiving. Uh, and it was really one of, one of the very special vintages ever. So I'm going to skip that. Um, so just a couple of uh, points here on how sustainability had its origin. And the, the first time that the, the term, I think, was really uh, used with um, intention in the lexicon was in a 1987 UN uh, World Report, World Commission on Environment and Development, in which they said sustainability is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So that's the, where I'm painting the big picture for you now, and that's a little vague, and we'll, we'll get to learn more about what specifically that means for us. Um, and then a couple years later, the American Agronomy Society chimed in, and they said sustainable agriculture is one that over the long term enhances environmental quality, and the resource base on which agriculture depends provides for basic human food and fiber needs, is economically viable, and enhances the quality of life for farmers and society as a whole. So I think this is actually a pretty complete and thorough definition of sustainability, um, primarily because it hits on uh, three main points. That in order to be sustainable, either as an entity or a business or a farm or even in your own um, life, something should be socially equitable, environmentally sound, and economically feasible. I won't talk a lot about the economic feasibility tonight. Um, there's just too much to talk about. Um, but suffice it to say, if a business can't sustain itself economically, um, then it doesn't matter how well you treat the environment. If the business ceases to exist, that's certainly not, ex not sustainable. So on Long Island, uh, and in talking to some of my colleagues in the industry, um, when we talk about sustainability, we talk about it with some of these other terms, that it's actually a pathway for us. It's a dialogue. Um, it's a way of life. And it's um, a, a dynamic, evolving system that doesn't really have a specific definition that you can look up in textbook. Um, I especially like this bottom one. It's not a zero-sum game. It's actually a continuum toward improvement. And so even though all the farmers in our area may not be practicing sustainably, sustainable farming, um, we're all part of a dialogue and part of a discussion. And we're all working toward the goal of understanding and appraising and assessing all of our practices. So to kind of characterize it for you and, and how we might shift our thinking uh, from a traditional way of thinking to a sustainable way of thinking in terms of growing grapes, uh, we can pose this question, what pesticide should I use for this problem? Which is a pretty typical um, agricultural kind of question. Uh, I have a disease in the field and I need to kill it, basically. But uh, when you start to engage in a sustainable process, that question, we can kind of change and alter our thinking and think, hmm, so what measures could I take to minimize my use of and risk from this input? And so that has a whole plethora of questions surrounding it. Um, do I need to use this spray at a particular time for this particular disease organism? How much? Is it the best time to use it, et cetera? So I'm going to go through a few particular uh, specific points of things that we do in the vineyard um, that are part of our sustainability program. And first and foremost, I mean, I think 90% of our sustainability was actually um, done for us about 30 years ago. A lot of the, the vineyard owners on Long Island um, realizing the development, the intense development pressures from the millions of people that live on Long Island got together and sold or transferred the development rights to their properties to um, Suffolk County. And so what this means is most of the vineyards on Long Island are actually on 100-year, uh, they're called forever in farming, 100-year leases to the state or to the county. Uh, and this means that our vineyard will never be a 7-Eleven or a strip mall or a gas station or an outlet mall or anything, uh, which is predominant on Long Island in suburbia. So that's number one. We know that there's at least 3,000 acres of grapes on Long Island that for a hundred more years can be nothing else except farms. Um, 
We also emphasize in particular that a lot of the other vineyards and something that we do at Bedell is that we keep a lot of the ecosystem elements in flow. So it is a very um, uh, parcelized part of the world where a lot of homes have yards and fences and even a lot of the farms themselves have fences. And we try to maintain wildlife corridors. So this is a plot between a couple of our vineyards uh, where we left a wide swath and there's a very biodiverse cover crop here. It's actually in bloom here in the spring. Um, so we have anywhere between 30 and 50 species of clovers and fescues, grasses and legumes that all create a very uh, biodiverse environment and enhance the, the beneficial insect relationships. And then these are some bluebird houses. So bluebirds actually used to be quite common on Long Island and they're an, an, a native species and um, they've come across some hard times. Uh, and so there's actually a woman on Long Island who has a PhD in ornithology and she's worked with a lot of the vineyards to design a specific a bluebird house that bluebirds would like. And so we built these and we set these all out in the vineyard. And this is just a picture of our vineyard manager, Dave, checking the bluebird house. And we actually had some nesting pairs last year, so that was good. Um, we've also been an industry partner with Cornell University for several research projects. Um, uh, there's a program at Cornell called Vine Balance Workbook, um, and there's also an extension office on Long Island, and Cornell's done a lot of research for, on our property and a lot of the neighboring vineyards, um, testing out organic and sustainable fertilizers and peanut meal trials and leaf pulling trials and all kinds of things. And then this bottom one is quite important, which I'll get to later, but integrated pest management, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of when you go out into the field and you scout for diseases. Um, so I mentioned before the, uh, uh, the, the cover crop growing underneath of the vines. Um, prior to this, and you probably saw on this slide earlier, uh, this is what most vineyards used to look like on Long Island. So they had probably a four foot uh, weed free strip, which was, it's not just magic how that happens. So that was kept weed free with pre-emergent herbicides, usually Roundup. Um, and you know, the logic was, I guess, um, that it was neat and tidy. But after time, people were thinking, well, do we really need a weed free strip? Um, because over 3,000 acres, these four foot strips add up to a lot of application of, of uh, materials. But also, um, you know, Long Island is such a wet place and there's so much rain that actually we thought, well, we should probably have more plant material under the canopy of the vines to help soak up all of the rainfall. So it just is a logical thing that a lot more of the vineyards are starting to allow the grass to grow naturally all the way under the canopy. And it might just seem like a small thing, but it really is quite substantial to get people to change their mindset. So now a lot of our vineyards look more like this. They look more like a prairie meadow, kind of, with the vines growing out of a biodiverse cover crop. <clears throat> and also we emphasize, as one of our sustainable points, is using um, human labor over machines. And these are a couple of our guys planting some young Albarino grapevines out in the vineyard. Um, and then I mentioned at the bottom here pesticide use, which I'll talk about in a second. I don't want to dwell on chemicals, but it is certainly part of this. Um, and then composting. So we take all of our uh, materials that we, the byproducts of the process of making wine. So this is what's called a rachis. The rachis is actually that stem that holds clusters of grapes together, even the grapes you get from the grocery store. And after harvest, there's a lot of uh, rachi, rach, rachi, I'm not sure what the plural is, left over, uh, as well as the, the grapes, the skins themselves, after we press out the fruit to make the wine. And so we compost that. And this is a two-year-old compost heap, so it's looking pretty beautiful. And uh, we'll spread that out throughout the vineyard every year as an organic fertilizer. So that was some of our sustainability points in the vineyard. Um, a few of the things we do in the cellar, uh, first and foremost, we ferment entirely using indigenous yeast. So this is something that we actually pioneered and we're the only winery we think in Eastern North America making wines completely with indigenous yeast. And you might wonder what this means. Well, just a two second lesson on how wine is made. Grape juice has sugar in it, okay? Yeast eats sugar and they excrete alcohol. So alcohol is effectively yeast urine. 
and sort of. Uh, it still good, tastes good, though, right? So um, uh, the yeast that most wineries use are bioengineered yeast that come in a zip pack from Lalamande in France or a company in California. They, they generate yeast, they dry them, they freeze dry them, and they ship them to you. Well, the other interesting thing about grapes is that grapes have a microflora of yeast on them already. That's why they have that little white kind of cloudy appearance. And so you don't actually need to inoculate with a foreign yeast. And our winemaker is now in his 30th vintage making wines using entirely uh, indigenous yeast. So there's yeast everywhere. All of you have yeast all over your skin and on your face and your hands, and it's, fl it's floating in the air. And certainly in the winery environment, there's yeast everywhere as well. What we do at the beginning of every harvest is we have this large glass jug of Chardonnay juice. And then uh, we actually have a little ceremony where each of our employees goes out into the vineyard at, or into their backyards at home, and they collect something that they think is pretty or that is important to them, um, but that importantly is part of the native and indigenous local flora. So we bring in, um, there's some apples there, there's beach plums there, some wild roses, Rosa rugosa, um, chamomile, wild violets, and we bring in all the local flora elements from all around our vineyard and we put them into this starter culture. So an analogy, if you cook at home, this is sort of like a sourdough starter culture. We keep this percolating all throughout um, harvest and we use it to inoculate the fermentations of all of our different lots of wine. And so I think this is one of the, one of the biggest ways that we can produce natural wines and wines that are sustainable and in keeping with our own surroundings. I mentioned the use of hand labor over machines. Another thing we do at Bedell is we don't um, use machinery and pump fruit and juice from place to place. We use gravity in the whole process. So when we need to empty a tank, we open a valve and let it drain out. And then we have interns who come in and shovel out <laughs> the pumice. And we do take interns. And we had an intern two summer, two harvests ago from Iowa State. Is, is Jenny here? No, OK. Uh, we had a wonderful intern from Iowa State. So we do accept applications if anyone's interested. And you get to do this job. <laughs> but anyway, we use gravity. And in a lot of commercial wineries, big conglomerates, they'll pump juice and fruit from place to place through little hoses. And when you do that, you have a chance of shearing the seeds. And when you have, if you've ever bitten into a grape, the seeds are actually very bitter. And when you shear the seeds, you release those polyphenolic compounds into the wine, and you can have a pretty harsh wine. By using gravity and doing it all by hand, we extract much softer flavors, we think. Um, we use um, hand-coopered French oak barrels. And this is one of our cellar crew who's topping off some barrels right there. And then we also use natural cork. So there's a lot of debate right now about screw caps on wine and those artificial corks that are kind of plastic. But I'm here to tell you that natural corks are the most sustainable way to, to close a bottle of wine by far. Um, they are a 100% renewable resource harvested from the Quercus. This is an oak tree subspecies that is native to Portugal. And cork is actually from the bark of the cork tree. So cork trees can live to be 100 years old. The cork farmer comes in and he shaves off the bark of the cork tree in these big slabs. And then the tree will just regenerate the bark. And they can regenerate it. They usually do this once every five to nine years. And then the tree lives to be 100 years. So it's totally renewable. It's natural. It's biodegradable. It's effectively tree bark. And um, you're supporting the livelihood of, guess how many, two million uh, farmers in Portugal uh, depend on the cork industry. So another part of sustainability for us is supporting farmers in other parts of the world. And I think the last thing the world needs is another petroleum product that we dump in the landfill, like a screw cap. So I'm forcefully opposed to screw capping wines. And you couldn't tell. Um, and this, this is a cross section of how we make cork. Uh, and if you haven't ever seen the process, it's, it's really cool. Um, this is just the cross-section of the, of the bark of the tree that you saw the guy chopping off right there. And it's extruded from the bark, just like that. And that's a cork you'd find in a bottle of wine. And then you pay different prices for different grades of cork. There's about 30 different grades, and you can pay anything from a couple cents a cork to $1.25 a cork.
for the very best. <clears throat> so one other uh, aspect of our use of indigenous yeasts is that our wines tend to mimic and reflect the uh, flavor and aroma profiles of our region. And this is a, a beech plum, which is a prunus uh, species of plum that grows on the sand dunes of the coastal northeast, coastal New England, Long Island. It's a beautiful plant. You've, we have some similar things here in the Midwest, like choke cherries, and I think there's plums in the ditches around that my mom used to make jam out of. But this is a very similar thing, and a lot of people think that some of our wines, that, that the reds in particular, have flavors that are redolent of beach plums. Um, but an interesting aspect of our work is that, you know, in the wine world, you're constantly trying to describe what you do because there's so many tens of thousands of wineries on earth. And you have to be able to say why it is that what you make is different from the other wines. And um, so the flavor profiles are some of the ways that we differentiate our products. And no one else has our unique combination of local flora and local flora uh, aromatics. And so we think that's unique and special to what we do. And another quick chemistry lesson, um, in case you're not familiar with, I can't help myself, but you have to know this because it's really cool. A strawberry will only taste like a strawberry because it only has strawberry aroma chemicals in it. And a banana is only going to taste like a banana because it has banana aroma chemicals in it. But the grape is the only fruit in the world that actually contains the aroma chemical compounds of every other fruit, and in fact a lot of things besides fruit. So there are almost 400 aroma chemical compounds in grapes uh, that uh, resemble other things. So when a yeast eats a sugar, sugars are all floating around in space in wine attached to aroma molecules. Okay, so when you taste a grape that's not fermented, it just kind of tastes like a grape. But when the yeast cleave the sugar from the aroma molecules, you're left effectively with a solution of hundreds of aroma molecules that can smell like any number of things. This is why when you see people taste wine and they swirl the glass and they smell it and they think, oh, it's like cherries or vanilla or something. They're literally smelling those flavor chemicals in the wine. They're not just making that up. Uh, it's true. It's, it's chemistry. So better living through chemistry. Um, one last point about sustainability, and this is the bottle that's sitting right here in front of me. So this is our wine called Musée. Uh, which features a specially commissioned artist label. And so we also commission New York-based artists um, to design our labels for us, which is another part of our sustainability effort. Um, the artists are all good friends of our owners, um, and so they are happy to do this for us, and we pay them with a couple cases of wine. And our owner, it's, I'm fortunate to work for a gentleman who's actually on the board of trustees of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. So we get to commission some pretty exciting artists to do our labels. This is a gentleman named Chuck Close who did this label for us. Um, you might have heard of him or seen him. He's a quadriplegic. He's been on the cover of Time magazine. Um, he used to be the dean of the art school at Yale, I believe. And um, he paints giant portraits of people's faces with a million little squares. Um, but he's a New York-based artist. He's a living, a modern master. And he was given the National Medal of Arts by Bill Clinton in 2000. And he is an avid gardener and a huge food and wine fan, lives on the east end of Long Island, and he's a friend of our owners. So we commissioned him to do this label for us. It's actually a daguerreotype of, of Merlot grapes, and a daguerreotype was the uh, original form of photography uh, where you expose the image on a glass plate. Um, so he described this as, um, as a nude um, because daguerreotype uh, used to be considered the most detailed and, and impressively detailed way to take a photograph. And then you only have one original on the plate. You can't digitally uh, reproduce it, although we did, obviously, for the label. Um, so when you get a chance, if you want to come up later and look at it, it's incredibly detailed. I was in my horticulture seminar yesterday. I even said you can see a little powdery mildew <laughs> in the grapes. Um, it's a funny story. I took these grapes in to Chuck Close's studio in Soho in a cooler with dry ice. and. Um, I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I knocked on the door and I walked in and he has 10 assistants working with him. And I stepped into his studio and um, Kate Moss was there naked. <laughs> and it was, um, you know, a little startling. And I was like, okay, I'm 
here with your cooler full of grapes, Mr. Close. And uh, he was working on a whole series of daguerreotypes. And he, um, you can look it up on the internet. He did a whole series of daguerreotype photos of Kate Moss naked, which are now in the permanent collection, I believe, at the Museum of Modern Art, and they're, they're beautiful. But he, he did a whole series of photos of famous people. But that was my story for the day, and I <laughs> handed him the cooler of grapes and left. Anyway, also, it goes without saying, recycling was the buzzword. Probably now that's a 10-year-old buzzword, but all of our uh, labels are printed on 100% post-consumer waste recycled paper, and our glass bottles are now made with uh, recycled glass as well, and we do recycle all of the glass and paper in our facility. So we're running out of time. I want to allow some time for questions, but quickly, I also just want to mention that we're uh, starting to establish regional certification on Long Island, and this is a process that I'm helping lead, and our winemaker has really been the driving force behind um, Long Island Sustainable Wine Growing Incorporated. So we've started a 501c3 nonprofit organization, which will provide third-party um, certification of all of our wines. And we figured, well, you know, we've been using sustainable practices for 30 years. But in the real world, you don't get gold stars for things like that, because actually no one cares, unless you tell people and you force them to understand what you're doing. So, you know, it wasn't good enough, in our, at least in our business climate, uh, to just feel good that we'd been growing grapes sustainably for 30 years. We also need to be able to prove to people in a serious way that they're certified as sustainable and put a little sticker on our label and tell people that this is what we're doing and this is why, um, you know, if they're environmentally minded about the products they purchase, this is why they should care. So we've developed a coalition of like-minded wineries um, with this goal in mind to communicate the practices to the public in an understandable manner, to highlight shared principles among all the various certification philosophies, and forge better relationships with consumers who make environmental awareness a priority. And at the end of the day, we also want to be seen as proactive leaders in our world um, because we, we are in such an urban environment so that if there were ever any question about the status of our groundwater, for example, uh, we could say we were being very proactive. So we have a technical working group, which thank God I'm not part of. Uh, this is a group of vineyard managers that get around uh, a table and look at chemical books about which pesticides and fungicides have particular use um, and efficacy for different disease organisms. Um, but ultimately, we use this as our guide that protective materials for plants can't be problematic for the fragile groundwater ecosystem. Um, we're working out the enrollment requirements, but we think there'll be probably a, an annual fee um, growers who want to join the sustainabil sustainability program will have to complete an annual um, self-evaluation of the, all of their own practices on the farm, and then uh, they'll we'll have a third part, a person come in and inspect the farms and go over their workbook with them and make sure that they're compliant. And I should note that also, um, everyone who's participating will have written plans for wildlife compensation areas, um, their cover crops, vineyard maps, and uh, they'll be expected to have their sprayers calibrated annually. Um, but I think most importantly is that we're being very inclusive. So all the growers are at the table right now. The growers that are, are extreme to the left and to the right on the production scale of things. Everyone's at the table talking about sustainability. Maybe not everyone at the table is going to qualify for the program initially because, you know, maybe they're not all using the best practices. But the point is that it's a dialogue and it's a communication and it's a continuum and maybe someday they'll be able to think about the different kinds of practices that they'd want to use. Um, just a few other things that people would be expected to have. Plans in place for their farm to reduce runoff um, with physical structures, vineyard floor management. And this is critical, the timing of pesticide and fertilizer applications with pre precipitation forecasts. In Long Island we get over 50 inches of rain a year and if you spray your vineyard and then it rains the next day, that's a huge waste of money and it's a greater chance of leaching into the groundwater. And um, these are very important questions for sustainability that we're really striving to drill down on a detailed level with our peers. And this is a practical example of a vineyard work calendar that we're helping everyone in the region um, devise. So this is a 52 week calendar year from week one to 52. And then these, is the, these are the activities that take place in the vineyard throughout the whole year. So pruning, tying, bud break, bloom, 
Veraison. If you're not familiar with Veraison, that's when the grapes change from green color to purple or black. <coughs> and then harvest, of course. So it might seem kind of elementary, but uh, these are interesting things to kind of nail down. And I'll give you one example. Um, catch wire lifting. We've had some people say, well, you know, I noticed an outbreak of spider mites around the time that we lifted our catch wires. And, you know, we think, hmm, I wonder why that is. And the reason, of course, is that spider mites like dust, and they live in dust, and they nest and lay their eggs in dust that settles on the film on the surface of grapevine leaves. So it's, it's a good chance to think, hmm, okay, well, maybe the practices and things you were doing in your vineyard at the time that the dust mites were breeding were raising up dust, and maybe you were driving through with your tractor too many times, or maybe it was dry and the, and the dust was um, disseminating into the air, and so you created an environment in which those insects could thrive. Um, but again, that's the kind of conversation you can't really have unless you have everyone at the table talking openly about their practices in, in a constructive way. So that's part of the sustainability process as well. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm on the verge of losing my voice. So. I want to show a little video to close with because I actually think it covers a couple of the things that I talked about. It's just a three or four minute video that many of you have probably already seen. Um, but uh, I think it's a testament to a couple of things. The first is that the flavors of the things that we eat can hearken us back to a particular time or place. And you remember I was talking about Long Island wines being redolent of the native flora of the coastal northeast. So think about that when you see this video. And the other thing, uh, which is a little sentimental for me, which is that um, greatness can come from anywhere, and you can do anything you want in this world. And uh, coming from Iowa State, I see a lot of students in the audience. So, uh, well, I'll let the video do the talking. It's a little smarter than I am.
And when the story is done, he goes stands, thanks us for the meal, and leaves without a word. The following day, his review appears. In many ways, the work of a critic is easy. We risk very little, yet enjoy a position over those who offer up their work and their selves to our judgment. We thrive on negative criticism, which is fun to write and to read. But the bitter truth we critics must face is that in the grand scheme of things, the average piece of junk is probably more meaningful than our criticism designating itself. But there are times when a critic truly risks something, and that is in the discovery and defense of the new. The world is often unkind to the new talent, new creations. The new needs friends. Last night I experienced something new, an extraordinary meal from a singularly unexpected source. To say that both the meal and its maker challenge my preconceptions about fine cooking is a gross understatement. They have brought me to my core. In the past, I have made no secret of my disdain for Chef Gusto's famous motto, Anyone can cook. But I realize only now do I truly understand what he meant. Not everyone can become a great artist, but a great artist can come from anywhere. It is difficult to imagine more humble origins than those of the genius now cooking at Gusto's, who is, in this critic's opinion, nothing less than the finest chef in France. I will be returning to Gusto's soon, hungry for more. It was a great night. <laughs> the happiest of my life. All right. So that was my closing thought to you, which I think hits on a couple of points, which one was the, that flavors can harken us back to a place and a time. Um, and two, that you can do anything you want from anywhere in the world. So you're at Iowa State. You can go anywhere and do anything you want. And I never thought I'd be standing here 15 years ago. Um, and as Anton said, yeah, he said it better than anyone could. So, <laughs> um, And then the last point, which um, is somewhat relevant and I didn't touch on a whole lot, which is the role of critics. And in my line of work, uh, critics really rule. And it's almost like the movie world, where if you get a bad review, uh, it's not so good. But if you get a great review, it can propel your business and your life to, to new and exciting places. Um, but I think the most important thing is to know what's inside of your heart and what you want to do and what you believe in as both an artist and a, and a farmer, if that's what you're doing, or in anything you do in your work and in your life. Um, if you stay true to what you know is right, then ultimately the, the criticism, good or bad, uh, shouldn't really matter all that much to you. So, Anyway, with that, I'd love to take questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, you did mention that you didn't want to go into too much detail about the analysis of the film. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could say something brief about what you do differently from other vineyards because you are a sustainably focused maker business analysis of the film. Right. Well, the, the main challenge in terms of economics for us and the sustainability question um, as it pertains to the vineyard is the cost of, of managing the vineyard and, and the cost of the disease control during the summer. Um, and, you know, I mentioned briefly that the integrated pest management approach where you can be more targeted and specific about uh, when an organism arises in the vineyard and when it needs to be sprayed. An old way of thinking about managing vineyards would be, oh, it's, it's Tuesday at 4 o'clock, I'm going to spray now. Or it's Thursday at, and I'm at noon, and I always spray every Thursday at noon, which is an untailored and blunt approach. It's like hitting the problem with a sledgehammer. And when you spray kind of randomly or haphazardly, you're not sure if you're actually killing the disease organism specifically that you want to. Um, and, you know, like I said, it could rain the next day. So um, spray material is not um, inexpensive, and you can spend six figures 
easily um, on spray material, managing a vineyard on Long Island for a year. Um, so those questions, even though they seem a little, they might seem a little small in the scheme of things, actually they do add up. So that's an important sustainability question for us in terms of economics. Um, also, um, we try to support the local community and other restaurants and other craftsmen and other farmers as much as we can. Um, I do think that the, the village of people, uh, and I mean village by in the Hillary Clinton sense of the word village, um, bringing people together in our wine and food world on Long Island helps uh, sustain and lift the entire industry. So there was a day when Long Island didn't have any good restaurants or hotels and the wineries were kind of out there floating in the wind by themselves. Um, but we've encouraged and fostered an entire wine and food community, including farmers markets and restaurants that emphasize local products. And it's helped, um, as I pointed out in one of the first slides, lead to a $1 billion economic impact for our region. So now there's more to do for people than just come drink at a winery. They can stay overnight and eat at a restaurant and do lots of other things. So that's a roundabout answer. You're welcome. Well, um, <clears throat> um, when, what issue comes up? Like the rain? Like the ability to work here more slowly. Yeah. Well, there are some compounds that are on the market that are more specific than others. Um, some of the newer compounds are more targeted and specifically target one thing, whereas a lot of the older compounds were more broad spectrum and would kind of just knock out a lot of different things. But... Um, that is not as necessarily a sustainable approach to just knock the problem on the head with the sledgehammer. So um, then again, on the other side of the coin, some of the newer products that are considered low risk by the Environmental Protection Agency are highly leachable in groundwater. Um, so they might be great for a region that doesn't have groundwater issues, but they're not so great for us. So all those things, all those questions have trade-offs and need to be considered on an individual basis. Yes, hi. Um, are there any resistant varieties to Norton's No. You know, uh, <laughs> the closest I can think of is Norton. So Norton, uh, which I think is native of Missouri, um, I believe, there's a trial plot of Norton on Long Island, and they only last year they only needed to spray it twice all year, which is remarkable. I mean, we have other wineries have to spray dozens of times. So... Norton would be the closest thing I, I can think of. I was talking to a geneticist at Cornell a couple of months ago, and I was saying, you know, we've genetically engineered almost everything else to have resistance or not resistance to almost everything, you name it. And yet we still have grapevines all around the world, uh, that uh, none of which are genetically modified to be resistant to the disease that is so, um, is so prevalent for them. A couple diseases. One is phylloxera, the root louse, that killed every vine in the world in 1880. Um, you know, and I guess we haven't gotten to that place yet where that genetically modified grape vines would be acceptable to people. But, you know, if I could have a Chardonnay vine or a Merlot vine that didn't need any upkeep, you know, and was resistant to everything that nature threw at it, that would be, that would be pretty terrific. So someone will get rich on that someday, I hope. Yes. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And wine is a very historically driven industry anyway. Um, so I think it would be a problem for a lot of people. And a lot of grapevines are 80 to 100 years old, and there's history and wineries in France and Italy that are you know a thousand years old. So yeah, it would be hard. Yes. Um, it's definitely uh, new. We are definitely at the forefront of this, um, although there are a couple. Um, I would say that the world gold standard for sustainability in wine is Oregon. Uh, there's a group called Oregon Live, uh, Low Input Viticulture and Enology. They have a really great website. You could check it out. Um, they're at the top of their game, for sure. Um, but they have a different climate than us. It's not really as wet, and they don't have the same kinds of disease pressures. Um, there have been some other sustainability initiatives from other regions in the world. 
Um, and in terms of your direct question of competition, I don't necessarily, um, I mean, I think people will look for anything that dif distinguishes a wine from the wine next to it on the shelf. Um, you know, I think there's 9,000 wineries in the U.S. alone and tens of thousands in the rest of the world. And so grapes are one of the few, maybe the only agricultural product that is really a luxury good. And we strive, and everyone in the wine world is desperate to not be a commodity uh, and to make everything seem different. And, uh, and Anton Ego said it as well, and things that are new need friends. And, um, and we're in sort of a frantic, in the wine world, there's this frantic pursuit of the new and what's the hot new grape from the hot new part of the world. And um, so I don't, I don't know if sustainability is going to be the hot new thing. In, we don't really, you know, we're not really chasing a trend. We're doing it because we think it's the right thing to do. And the problem, too, with chasing trends in the wine world is that by the time you've caught it, you're four years behind the next one. So, yes? I would think that uh, indigenous fermentation would be kind of risky. Yes. And No, that's a really great question. Are you a microbiologist? No, okay, you're just brew. super smart. You brew, okay, yeah. <laughs> it is risky, and what he's referring to is that we could, for example, have a rogue strain of yeast take over the fermentation and make the wines taste pretty bad. Um, we've had a track record of very clean fermentations, and I think it's because a few of the primary organisms that are doing the fermentations are highly predatory, and they maintain their presence in the winery kind of all year round, either magically because they're on the surface of things, or also because our wine ma winemaker maintains a small jug of fermenting juice all year round. Um, so we, do, we don't scientifically, you know, we don't look under microscopes and we don't say, oh, we have the strain that did the ferments and it was so good and we want to use it every year. We allow the, the ferments to arise naturally. But I do think that probably if we did look under a microscope, there'd be a couple that are doing the job year in and year out. So, yes? Ah. Uh. Right. Yes. That's a great question, and we have, actually. And the reason we don't do the glass etching is that it's actually quite expensive, and you have to order huge volumes in order to get the price breaks. And a lot of our wines are made in small batches, and like 50 to 100 cases. Um, so to do a glass bottle etching would be prohibitively expensive. But for a wine where they make thousands and thousands, or maybe even hundreds of thousands of cases, that could be a good option. And then you wouldn't need any, the paper at all. I don't know much, though, about the actual etching process and the chemicals they use in that and what that's about, but there are some pretty bottles. Yes, uh, you had your hand up first. Yeah, more, more grape juice. Yeah, we just keep, um, we keep some juice. Uh, you can also just keep it at a low, low temperature, and the ferment will continue but will be in almost like a stasis. Um, like, f uh, four Celsius, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but, yeah, like in the 40s or 50s, so, they're hardy, they're tough little, org little things. Yes? Hydrochloric acid, you etch Oh, okay, great. All right, then we probably don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want that. Um, you mentioned the agricultural history of the island, and if you look at King County and Nassau County, yes. it went from agriculture, hugely agricultural food, yeah. further than yeah. As it made that transition, it almost destroyed the aquifers, the freshwater quality of the aquifers by bringing in yeah. overpumping it and bringing in the salt water. Right. And you've got that one little enclave out there where you're surrounded by the ocean. Yeah. Salt water, you're in a, in a, in a coastal aquifer. Mm-hmm. You're dependent on the groundwater. What are you guys doing? The whole agriculture planet, what are you doing to keep the salt water intrusion? Oh. Minimum? Uh, from intruding in the water table? Yeah, into the water table. The aquifers? Well, gosh. I mean, we're not specifically doing anything or involved in it. The DEC is definitely involved yeah, in it. Not really. No. Oh, okay. Uh, no. And, um, 
But it is interesting. And during hurricanes, sometime on Long Island, um, there'll be they call it salt spray. And this year we had a hurricane, and some of the vineyards had very severe salt spray damage. And um, it's not just that the hurricane is bringing water off of the ocean, but also it's coming up in the water table. And there is actually a quality that a lot of critics use, and we use a lot in describing our white wines. And we say that they have a certain saline minerality to them. And it is actually, I'm not, at first we thought we were just making it up. But uh, <laughs> so many people over years keep using that descriptor in our wines, like they kind of taste saline in a way, in a good way, the aromatic crisp whites. Um, so now we're embracing it as part of our local terroir. <laughs> Because we can't really change it, so it is what it is. <laughs> yes. When you sort of answer the chief sort of has a question, I think I got a great one. We should be worried that one hundred degree contact is such kind of any concern about um, sea level. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I suppose in the long term sense of things. Um, we are basically growing grapes at sea level. And if there were a sudden and dramatic rise in sea level, uh, we would be out there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I actually try to worry about things that I can have some modicum of control over, and that I have no control over. So for the time being, I'm trying to run my business and grow my grapes, and I am at sea level. And if something catastrophic happens, then I don't know. I guess I'll move to Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Last year we processed about 125 tons of grapes. And we are pretty small in the scheme of things. Um, we make 10,000, 15,000 cases of wine a year. Um, a winery like Gallo of Sonoma, which I'm sure all of you have heard of, I don't even know how many millions they make, but they make in the tens of millions of cases a year. And I was recommending earlier, there's a great documentary film that everyone should watch if you are interested in wine and care about the politics and economics of wine. It's called Mondo Vino um, by Jonathan Nossiter. Um, and it's a three-hour-long documentary. It's won a lot of awards. But it really highlights the difference in the wine world between the small artisanal farm producers and the global conglomerate, what I call beverage producers. Um, and it's worth looking at if you're interested. Very thought provoking. Yes, Carol. Hi. Hi. Um, I just really found out recently that um, some wines are vegan and other winemakers use animal products. Mm. Yes, the only animal product that anyone would really, I think, feasibly use in winemaking would be egg whites. And egg whites are used when, let's say, you have red wines sitting in barrels, and red wines can be very, very tannic. And sometimes you need, and tannins are those um, compounds that dry out your mouth. And sometimes you need to precipitate out some of the tannins chemically so that the wine is more, is more pleasurable to drink. And uh, there are a couple of ways to do that. One is you can put it through a sophisticated filtration process. Two is you could just let the wine settle and age naturally, and over time, years, those tannins will settle out and you don't have a problem. Or you can force the tannins to precipitate by putting even either whipped egg whites into the barrels. You just dump them in th out of a copper uh, bowl. Or you can use animal casein products, which uh, would precipitate out the whites. So that would be the difference between vegan wine and not vegan wine. And uh, I don't know if, um, I actually don't even know any wineries that label their wines as vegan because most of us just assume that it that it is anyway, because very few people use those things. But sometimes you need to, and in, in Bordeaux, a lot of the tannic reds, they, they use egg whites as well. So that'd be the only way. Yes? Um, also, you mentioned the Eisenglass. Yes. Uh, the, uh, jelly yes, Eisenglass, thank you. Um, and what's that made from? Car uh, it comes from Sturgeon Sweet Rye, I think. Okay, yes. <laughs> so that wouldn't be vegan. Thank you. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, good question. All of our tanks are built on stilts, and I'm saying that in all seriousness. All of the tanks are um, probably five or six feet off the ground, and so when we harvest the fruit, 
and we bring it in for the first time. Um, we sort it on a sorting table, and it gets lifted up into the tanks with a conveyor belt. So that's the stage when we use electricity to get the grapes into the tank and elevate them up. And then they're at a level where when we need to empty the tank, it's high enough that we can do the work that way. A lot of wineries that are more sophisticated than my own have elaborate gravity systems where the winery is like five stories tall under the ground, and the fruit will come in at ground level, and as it ages and is processed, it kind of goes down. If you ever have a chance to travel the world and look at wineries, there's some spectacular gravity-fed systems out there. Right. So there has to be some mechanism to get that liquid into right. another tank. We will pump juice of finished wine okay. when we need to get it to the bottling tank, for example. But we'll never pump anything that's solid, like uh, skins. We call it pumice, grape pumice, seeds, or skins. And that way you won't have the shearing action that I talked about to release the bitter flavors. Right. Yeah. But in order to bottle it, I mean, if I had a more money. I would build my bottling line underground, underneath of the tank, so I could do everything with gravity. But to bottle, we do have to pump it up to the bottling machine. Yeah. How do you feel your uh, agronomy degree from Iowa State, which you know, we heavily focused on corn and soybeans, uh, <laughs> did it prepare you at all for transferring over to viticulture? Okay. Here's the t here's the dirty little secret. My degree's not in agronomy, oh, okay. um, but. Uh, I was in the honors program, and I had the very fortunate, uh, and Dana Schumacher here, can as she can attest, I was in the interdisciplinary studies major, so I took all kinds of classes. I took some horticulture, botany, biology, but I also took a lot of philosophy and political science classes. So I, I recommend to people, and Pat's daughter, I think, did a pretty similar thing. When you, when you do a diverse degree, an interdisciplinary degree, you can tailor it for your life however you want. And I think the most important thing is that you learn how to think critically. And whether that's about agronomy or anything else, if you take a wide array of classes and you don't pigeonhole yourself into one particular thing, then you know you can do anything you want. But yeah, my degree is not in agronomy. Um, actually, I was determined not to be an Aggie here at Iowa State because I grew up on a, a farm in South Dakota. So I was like, I'm going to take philosophy classes. <laughs> I'm going to be like liberal and cool. I'm not going to wear my cowboy boots. And anyway, it worked out okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Is there such a thing as like a recycled basket? Because you you hollowed out the the culture from the ground. Maybe I didn't understand. Corks. The corks? Yeah. So is there a recycled basket? Oh oh like a recycled cork. Yeah. Yes, actually. So you would that be like economically prohibitive or would that like be reviewed? Or likewise a um mercury made barrel? And I know like the uh, yeah. case right. Those are great questions. Okay, the first part is that there are recycled corks, but they take old corks and chop them up into a fine dust and then extrude them with glue, effectively, to make a new cork. So they're not so great. Um, there's actually been some research that shows that the micro qualities of the glue in artificial corks, both chopped up cork and fake plastic corks, has adsorption quality and actually can adsorb some of the flavor and aroma molecules in the wine. So I guess the answer is no. I still think cork. Yeah. Yeah. No, we can't. And you know, we get it across here on a boat, which is still a lower carbon footprint than getting it from California on a truck. Um, and there's a great study I can refer you to about the carbon footprint of wine. And actually, for a New Yorker, uh, the carbon footprint of French and German wines is about half as it is uh, California wine because it's so much more efficient to get wine and heavy goods across to New York by boat. Um, but anyway, I digress. Uh, we collect corks in our tasting room, and then customers come in and take them and use them for craft projects. But uh, in terms of a local source of barrel, no, although um, there are uh, some oak tree forests in Minnesota and Missouri uh, that are known for making good oak for barrels. The best oak still comes from France and is hand coopered in France using French oak. And it's a centuries old tradition there. And um, you really can't get oak 
that's better than French oak. There's some Hungarian oak, but American oak is still, um, you know, at the margins, I would say. So, you're welcome. And we have a reception where you can okay. all ask more questions. So okay. let's give our speaker another round of Thank applause. Thank you, Pat.